Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank all the organizers for this opportunity to speak at such a great webinar series. I uh, just want to make sure everyone can hear me. Uh, um, yeah, so I've been at NIST 10 years, um, and I'm going to talk about some of the modeling efforts for monoclonal antibodies and high concentration formulations. And if I can get the slide to change, there we go. So just really quickly, when I mention any commercial or trade names in this talk, it does not imply endorsement by NIST. So there were a lot of scientists involved in various parts of this work I'm going to talk about today. So I'd like to start by just acknowledging uh, a number of people, both at NIST and, and IBBR, and three uh, joint postdocs that we've had with IBBR over the years, as well as some collaborations with NCNR. And, and Linksys and, and CNRS. Uh, I'm going to present two case studies with pharmaceutical antibodies done in collaboration, one with AstraZeneca, as well as the Stevens Institute. So this is the beautiful map included with the Linksys NIST webinar, and uh, Kale did an amazing job with this. So just reminding everyone we're stuck, maybe fortunately or unfortunately, in the pits of coarse graining today. So this is the outline uh, of the talk. First, I will uh, motivate some um, reasons why we need multi-scale antibody simulations to address challenges in the pharmaceutical industry. And after introducing a few examples of the kinds of experimental data that we're hoping to compare with to validate our models, I'll introduce a few different kinds of uh, models, both isotropic and isotropic um, models with flexibility in the hinge, and then I'll pr present these two case studies with real world uh, pharmaceuticals, trying to help rank order them using these coarse grain models. And if I have time at the end, maybe five minutes, I'll briefly talk about the software that was used during all of this um, that's available to the community. All right, so what is an antibody and why do we care about them? So on the left here is a molecular dynamic simulation of the NIST map by Christina Berganzo that you may have seen earlier in this series. And in case you missed some of the previous talks, just notice that uh, antibodies have these three domains that are connected by this relatively flexible hinge region. And they have this characteristic Y shape where the arms or what we call the fabs at the top here um, have variable regions that bind to antigens. And the uh, bottom is the, what we often call the FC is um, more conserved than, than the fabs. And antibodies are in about, uh, if you look at like pharmaceuticals just in general and rank them by sales, you'll see that they make up almost half of the top pharmaceutical products. Here's a couple of examples. Um, and they're used to treat things like cancer, arthritis, psoriasis, and asthma. So they're very important um, in industry and uh, they're very large complex molecules. We'd like to be able to understand them better and simulate them and help uh, with with um, screening pharmaceutical candidates. So they're big molecules. So one of their problems is that they suffer from physical, some physical stability issues. So here's an example of viscosity of two different MABs as a function of their concentration. And you see, as you increase their concentration, the viscosity can go above this subcutaneous injection limit. And that means that they then have to be delivered to patients by IV which is costly and, and time consuming. So we'd like to be able to predict, uh, you know, MAB1, between MAB1 and MAB2, we could have predicted this without having to make them first, which is uh, really expensive or make large quantities of it to do the experiments. Um, and also the companies don't really wanna share exactly what MAB1 and MAB2 are. These are often like highly uh, guarded um, sort of secret secrets. and. It's not just the viscosity at high concentration. We also have to think about um, issues with liquid, liquid phase separation and aggregation as well. So if we wanna study antibodies at, at high concentration and study their interactions uh, with each other, at minimum, we have to simulate at least two, which is already 40,000 atoms. And if you wanna look at uh, phase behavior and viscosity, that's collective behavior over a long length scale. So that would actually require something like a 10 million atom simulation, which is simply not feasible with the standard molecular dynamics kind of approach. So that's why we need to develop multi-scale and coarse grain models that capture the essential physics of the antibodies, but they have less interaction sites. So we don't 
look at every, we don't have every single atom interacting. We need some kind of more uh, coarse model than that, but still captures the flexibility of the hinge and specific patchy interactions on the surfaces. So ideally, the coarse grain models also need to be able to capture the effects of the solution. For example, how they behave as you change the salt concentration or the pH conditions, as well as if you add crowders or excipients in the solution. And these are all things that we're, we're working toward. So now I'll show some examples of the kinds of uh, experimental data that we'd like to look at to validate our models. And one thing you're going to hear a lot about in this talk is the second osmotic beer coefficients. So a quick vignette on these. Um, this is a the formula for the second uh, Vera coefficient of an isotropically interacting particle where U of R is the, is the uh, interaction as a function of separation distance. So you can see that it's essentially an orientationally averaged um, metric for the interaction between uh, two particles. And it's a very... Um, it's very readily calculated in, in theory simulation as well as measured in experiment. So it's a very nice uh, direct comparison between um, the simulations and, and theory and experiment. It's also used um, in this relatively famous um, Norman Frankel ex corresponded extended corresponding states to collapse phase diagrams. It's uh, very um, efficiently calculated with Mayer sampling Monte Carlo, uh, which integrates these Mayer functions in a um, um, efficient way. And so we'll be using this for the, uh, the MAB models. So here are some recently published experimental data on the NIST MAB. Uh, at, at low concentration, we have um, examples of um, charge as a function of pH for both the full MAB and the different uh, FC and FAB domains that was measured by electrofluoretic uh, light scattering. We have a second osmotic beer coefficients that were also measured with light scattering, both for the fab arms as well as the whole MAB, and also how they we have these values over a range of ionic strengths as well as pHs, which is a, is a great resource for um, trying to build models that hopefully capture these, uh, these kind of solution effects. Now, at, at finite concentrations, some of the most informative experimental measurements are small angle scattering. So here is the scattering intensity for the NIST map at uh, using x-rays from two milligrams per milliliter to 193. And so we'd like to use computer simulations to be able to calculate these, uh, uh, compute these, these, these um, scattering curves and interpret these interesting features like we would call these interaction peaks. And we can also get effective structure factors from these by taking one of these scattering curves and dividing by the, uh, the, the high dilution curve and getting an effective structure factor, which we can interpret uh, these peaks and fit to, them, to models, as well as we can readily calculate these with our coarse grain models and compare. All right, so first I'm going to introduce these isotropic models that capture flexibility and, and the maximum packing of antibodies. So remember that antibodies have these three domains that are flexibly connected by this hinge. And so one of the simplest models that we could think of for modeling antibody would be, besides just modeling it as an entire sphere, is uh, e modeling each domain as a sphere and connecting them with a flexible hinge uh, uh, region. And so we could improve this model by, by modeling each domain as a collection of spheres. For example, here, one of the domains is modeled by two spheres instead of one. And we can see that we, if we look at the scattering uh, at, at infinite dilution, that's the black curve here for the experiment. The red one is the seven bead and the blue is the four bead model. And you see improvement as you increase the number of spheres to, to model the antibody, you see better comparison with experiment, uh, but that comes at a cop at a at a big cost. That it it adds you know the number of interaction sites means it's twice as slow, as well as more complicated um, uh, bonding potentials and things like that. So look, using these kind of models though is is informative. We can see 
that and and I think I I uh, mentioned I should have mentioned again that these are mostly hard sphere like excluded volume interaction models. Uh, so we're we're mainly focused on high concentration. So 175 is is pretty high concentration for these antibodies, and we see for the scattering intensity when the domains are held um, as far apart as, as possible. That would be like this red curve here, and when and the blue curve is when the domains are as close as possible, and so we see very different scattering intensities. We see that the intensity increases as the domains are are closer together. And that's because of the improved uh, molecular packing. So they have a smaller sort of effective size. And you can see that the position of these interaction peaks also changes. So uh, for the more open structure to the more closed structure, you see that the peak shifts to lower Q values. And this also suggests that the, uh, the more open structures are interdigitating with each other. Between um, so basically another domain uh, of a different antibody could maybe try and fit in between here, and we're seeing similar differences for the uh, the higher resolution seven B model as well. We can also look at the the effect of making these models flexible. So this is again the scattering intensity of the the solid lines are the flexible fully flexible models, and the dashed lines are the rigid models. And we see the scattering intensity is higher, uh, again, because the, the flexible models are able to, to uh, pack better, and that increases the scattering intensity, and they have a, a smaller effective size. Um, so these were some of the first models that looked at flexibility in, in the hinge, whereas some of the previous coarse grain models just assumed the antibodies were rigid. Um, however, we didn't include um, anything more than excluded volume interaction. So we're not able to capture effects of um, the solution like, like salt concentration or pH or, or specific patchy interactions that, that uh, may lead to some interesting clustering behavior that our experimental collaborators have observed. So we're looking to, to really improve on these models. So that is the anstropic models that I'm going to show you today. Um, so just to briefly review the some of the coarse grain models that have have already existed in the literature, this is the one I just described. And you can see that there's a lot of different uh, coarse grain antibody models um, in the in the literature, and these are these are really great models. They've been used to uh, compare with experiments, and they've been hand tuned for uh, particular antibodies, and they take really a lot of effort from a talented scientists to um, to parameterize these because you have a lot of these questions like where do you put the beads how big are they how do they interact right and so one of the issues that we ran into with these with with building on these kind of models is the number of parameters uh, starts increasing and it makes it harder to um, screen these say if the, a pharmaceutical company wants to look at how these antibodies uh, behave with like 200 different sequences, and the sequences might only change just a little bit on one of these beads or something, or it might be all throughout the protein. Um, they also don't want to share the sequence of 200 different candidates. They would like to have a software that we could provide where they could just push a button um, and with with less parameter choices and uh, get some results, right? So. One of the things that I proposed when we first started meeting with the Linksys uh, simulation working group was going beyond these kind of spherical models, going beyond uh, in the physics community, we call these spherical cows, um, and trying some anisotropic models. So here's an example of a model of a monoclonal antibody that I, that I showed um, a few years ago as an example where you could model the fab arms as super uh, quadrics, and you can model, model the or the FC as super toroids, and uh, this builds on some of my previous work uh, in non-antibody applications. But when Sergey shared the work that he was doing and presented last year on this docking-based method of simulating proteins, I was I was really inspired. So, so briefly. The way I would describe this is if you treat these two proteins as like a ligand receptor, you can do this very efficient docking um, algorithm to find the most favorable configurations. And then there's a Monte Carlo move 
that uh, randomly samples among those, those configurations. And this is a really efficient method for simulating um, hundreds of thousands of, of proteins that are very crowded where these favorable interactions dominate. Now, in cases where the favorable interactions may not dominate or some of the, um, the repulsions or just uh, random um, configurations also play a role, uh, I'm not exactly sure how you would use this method to compute things like second osmotic vehicle coefficients um, or scattering intensities in cases where uh, there may be less concentrated or there's repulsions that are dominating. But I was very inspired by the idea, and I thought that um, what if we had represented a protein with an all-atom model to begin, and then we looked at uh, decorating the surface with what you could think of as like binding sites. So here I'm showing lysozyme decorate where the surface is decorated with these pink uh, MOF beads uh, with a 15 degree resolution in the solid angles. And so I'll, I could do sort of an angular scan where um, each one of these uh, uh, pink beads is a site for looking at how another lysozyme might interact um, over many different orientations of the of the particles. And if you roll something about the size of a water on the surface, you get for the 15 degree resolution, the solid uh, pink surface. And for infinite resolution, you would get the blue. So you can see that a 15 degree resolution in the angles is actually not a terrible uh, representation of the of the entire protein um, on, in terms of uh, ink, getting the angstrom level, at least getting the shape. So what I can do, and what I'm proposing here, is that we could take one domain of the antibody and fix it, and then systematically rotate the uh, another domain about it and calculate those interactions using an all-atom model that you store. And then during the course of uh, during the course grain simulation, you can uh, interpolate from that those pre-computed interactions. So if you have two rigid bodies, there's six degrees of freedom that you search over. Uh, if one domain is fixed, then the center of the other domain is given by three uh, coordinates, and then its orientation is three more. So you can think of uh, looking at this in terms of one distance and five angles. So this is a comparison of taking like an all-atom approach versus the pre-computed anisotropic model. So this all-atom model for an antibody domain would have about five and a half thousand atoms or interaction sites which is feasible for simulating a single protein. Uh, if you want to go for the anisotropic approach, this would be a single interaction site that has an anisotropic, that, has, uh, that depends on the orientation of the particles, the relative orientation. So to begin, you have this expensive calculation of, of how they interact over 15 degree resolution with five angles, which turns out to be over a million orientations. But once that's complete, then you have your simulations are about a thousand times faster than the all atom model because it has about the same computational cost of a, um, a three site uh, anisotropic model or as, as if this had three atoms. And there are some costs involved in this approach though. There's, of course, you have to store the table. It could be about a hundred megabytes or more and uh, with, with the 15 degree resolution. You also introduce a number of approximations. So the all atom model, uh, needs to be assumed to be rigid to make this uh, practical. Otherwise, you'd have to do an ensemble average calculation for every one of the million orientations. Uh, you'd also, we're also going to make the implicit, the solvent uh, implicit so that we don't have to integrate over the uh, solvent degrees of freedom. And we also assume that we can interpolate between these 15 degrees. So if 15 degrees is too big of an angle and you miss some very important patchy interactions, then you're just interpolating between two less favorable configurations and you miss that very important interaction. So that's another approximation that we have to consider. So this is the all atom model that, um, that I used in this work. It has um, excluded volume interactions from Amber and, and the Autoduck. Um, and it has, since there's an implicit solvent, it has a screen charge term with this kappa parameter that is determined by the temperature and, and the ionic strength or the concentration of sodium chloride. And the charges are also uh, assigned by PARSE and um, 
the pH determines the uh, charge states of the residues. So we can capture some effects of pH and, and the salt uh, concentrations. It also has a van der Waals short range attraction with a fitting parameter in front here. That's the one fitting parameter from, from this work that was published uh, that was fit over six different, I believe six or seven different proteins over a range of ionic strengths and pHs. So here's an example of the second osmotic vera coefficient as a function of ionic strength, where black is the all atom uh, model and the various color uh, symbols are from various experiments. So here's an example of a potential energy curve for two uh, fab domains of the arms of the antibodies that are fixed at a, just a, a arbitrarily chosen orientation. And so I'm looking at their, their interaction energy as a function of distance between the centers. So a, a little less than 60 angstroms is where they overlap. So below that point, it would be a, an infinite um, excluded volume potential. And you can see in this case, for this salt concentration, there's this short range attraction that goes um, to basically zero toward a cutoff. And, but if you decrease the amount of salt in the solution and, and you, you look at an ionic strength of 50 uh, millimolar instead, you see that the, the charge interactions aren't screened as much. So now you have this longer range repulsion that's above zero here. But, uh, as well as a short range attraction, which is an important feature of a lot of these kind of models that you'll see in the in the literature, that and and this model also captures that. And but it also depends on on orientation and things like that. So one of the major assumptions that we make in this approach is that the structure is rigid. So here I'm showing vera coefficients with ionic strength for a number of different uh, PDB structures of the lysozyme protein. So these lines here, these four different ones, are four different PDB structures of lysozyme. And the color uh, symbols here are various experimental data. So here I'm pointing out, you know, the effect of, of this rigid assumption in a way is tested by looking at different configurations, and we see differences in the Vera coefficient roughly on the order of uh, the variations that we see in experiment. I also included this all atom curve here, which uh, isn't, so these were using the coarse grain uh, 15 degree resolution uh, model, whereas this uh, purple curve is the all atom model, which um, doesn't have the, the resolution issue. And these were all done with uh, Mayer sampling. So, um, so it's interesting to see that the all atom was actually sort of over predicting the uh, Vera coefficient, but through some fortuitous cancellation of errors, the uh, coarse grain model actually matches the experiment maybe a little closer in some ranges of ionic strength at least. Now, as you get to higher ionic strength, uh, you're you're screening the charges more, and so an experiment it goes down more than you. See, but in the coarse grain model, you see it hits this plateau, and that could possibly probably be because your of the interpolation assumption where you're missing some very important uh the most attractive interactions might be missing in the model and those contribute very significantly as you increase the salt so this is uh only valid in certain ranges of ionic strength that you have to carefully consider when you're doing the coarse graining so when i showed this to mikhail and sergey about a year ago uh, Mikhail proposed to look at this lactoferrin protein that he's looked at in the past. It has this very interesting patchy interaction uh, at intermediate values, uh, intermediate salt concentrations. And um, if you decrease or increase the salt, then, then the uh, repulsions increase. So you have this interesting minima. And he that sort of challenged me to see if this coarse graining approach could capture that. So these orange points are the experimental second osmotic vera coefficients, and the, the red are the all atom, and the black plus uh, symbols are the um, coarse grain model with an 18 degree resolution. So we see that the all atom model does capture this uh, minima in the um, osmotic vera coefficient, and for the coarse grain model, it does have a minima, but it's not at the right position, and that again is likely because I uh, use this 18 degree resolution 
to, to model, and it may have missed some of the most important um, patchy interactions. And this is a very big protein. This is much bigger than uh, the lysozyme. So if you think of, um, in terms of arc angles, this is actually a very big spacing between um, the, the various um, orientations that we're looking at with 18 degrees, right? So we could improve that instead of modeling this um, lactoferrin as a single, one single anisotropic site, we could break it down into multiple sites, for example, and we could even introduce something like a flexible uh, bond between those. And even if we did for these smaller when, uh, collections of, of the atoms that we assume are rigid, uh, even using the same resolution, the arc length is now smaller, so the um, we could see some improvements there. And also, I'm just introducing this idea of breaking it down into multiple sites, because that's what we essentially had to do with the maps. So I talked a lot about, this is showing a, a coarse grain antibody simulation of a single MAB, and I talked a lot about the interactions between these domains, but how do we model the flexibility of this, this highly flexible uh, hinge and linker region? So the way that we do that in the coarse grain simulations, we use confederational bias Monte Carlo to randomly select from the angles and links here in the in the link in the hinge region, but those were informed by all atom uh, molecular dynamic simulations done by Christina. And let me show an example of that. So here we have probability of angles, which are for the solid line. These are from the all atom simulations, and they're the angles of these el elbows here, essentially between. So the black line would be the FC. Uh, angle from the FC to this elbow to the center of the hinge. And in the coarse grain model, we're going to just assume all of these angles are, are the same. And for the solid line, so the solid lines I'm showing here are from the all atom simulations, which include multiple ionic strengths. And I'm, I'm pointing that out because there's, there could be some very highly specific interactions between these domains that influenced this uh, probability uh, of these angles that you're seeing here. But the most important thing that we really wanted to get from the all atom is what is this minimum um, angle um, that we can, that we're likely to observe from an all atom simulation? Obviously uh, 180 is the maximum when it's straight. And so the, what I'm showing here for this coarse grain um, curve with the dash line is, having only excluded volume interactions between the domains. We, I'm not including the, um, the specific interactions between the domains. Those will be included in the simulation. But for getting this, this probability curve, this is essentially uh, like a sign distribution you would expect from randomly picking angles, but they were cut off at a certain uh, minimum angle. So the autumn informed this, um, this minimum angle choice. And we did the same sort of approach for the bond links as well. So that's the bond links between the center of this hinge and each of these uh, these red points where it connects to the rigid domain. And so from the all atom, we get the minimum and and maximum bond links. And uh, without with only excluded volume interaction, the coarse grain model, we see distributions like this. And this is a this is a big improvement on on previous models that either uh, that often would get this information just from like a single uh, crystal structure or something like that. So that is the model that we're going to use for these two case studies that I'm going to show with some uh, some real pharmaceutical antibodies. So again, this this idea of uh, from from the the introductory material. Uh, there's maps can have very different viscosities, and that can be something that's really important in to the companies um, that they would like to be able to predict early without having to make a bunch, which is really expensive, right? So the companies have come to us, and we I can't share too much information on the specifics of the antibodies, so we're just going to call them um, A, B, and C. But if we we did this case study in collaboration. Uh, with the companies where we have um, given that they give us this, this sequence of A, B, and C, are we able to predict which ones are going to be um, problematic in development? And so 
just with given the sequences, uh, we were able to get the structures by homology modeling from the NISMAP structure, which was done by Christina Berganzo. And then we applied the coarse grain methodology I just described to these, these structures and, and see if we can predict um, the, which ones would be problematic and which ones would not. So here is a sort of top-down view of the fab arms of each of the candidates A, B, and C. And the atoms are color-coded by uh, the type of residue, if it's hydrophobic or positively or negatively charged. And if I had um, um, audience participation, I might ask someone, you know, if they could tell me which one of these three, A, B, or C, or, or two, which, which ones look like uh, they could be problematic or which ones might have high viscosity. And, you know, maybe someone much smarter than me could, could figure this out. Um, but I, I'm going to try and just use a computer to and uh, apply this this kind of push button method without any adjustable parameters and see see what happens. So here are example simulations of map A and B using the coarse grain simulations. These would be these are 50 grams per liter, uh, six uh, pH, 150 millimolar of uh, salt, and so these would be a million atom simulations if we were using. Um, the just our standard molecular dynamics approach. Uh, but with the coarse grain model, I could run this for uh, a few hours on, on a laptop, this laptop I'm presenting and, and get uh, reasonable results. So I would uh, say that I can't really tell much of a difference between MAB A and B here just by looking at it, but we can compute properties like uh, the, the probability of the fab arms coming into contact, for example. So from the center of mass of one arm to the other it is the distance that I'm showing here. So around, if you remember before, around 60 angstroms is, is roughly the contact distance. So this is the showing the pair distribution. So the map B has a much more uh, likely uh, probability of the fab arms coming into contact than maps A and C. And so we know that's problematic uh, based on some of the previous coarse grain simulations, this was a uh, figure by by Marco a few years ago that that we find really useful. So let me walk through it. This is the second vir coefficient again, so lower vir coefficient means more attraction. And on this axis, the x-axis has uh, the basically the ratio of the attractions of the FC versus the fab. So if the FC is more attractive than the fab, you get these cases where they form these micellar-like structures. Where when you when you have enough of them, essentially the fab arms kind of crowd out the possibility of adding more, and so they they make these finite size clusters. Whereas if the if the fab arms are the more attractive ones, then the antibodies can essentially there's two arms to these antibodies, right? So they can hold hands, and and form these transit clusters that can span long distances. And uh, if the FC and fab are equally attractive then uh, you can get things like liquid-liquid phase uh, separation. And, and in, anywhere else in there, we would hope would be like a stable solution, right? So these candidates all had the same FC, and they had different fabs. But well, if MAB B has a much higher fab attraction, then it seems that it's more likely in this transient cluster region than the other ones. We can also look at the concentration dependence of these distributions. So here we're going from 50 to 200 grams per liter, and we see that map B has a relatively concentration independent peak. So that kind of tells me that map B is finding the other fabs uh, regardless of the concentration, whereas A and C are sort of, uh, as the concentration increases, they're just so happening to uh, finally find each other. We also can look at the vir coefficients of these antibodies. And we see that map B again has a um, a low VR coefficient, which means more attractions. And A and C seem to be uh, very similar and, and much higher. So the um, our, our our collaborators were, were happy to see these results. They say, um, yeah, this is pretty much what, what we knew about these antibodies before we gave gave you the sequences. So, so that was a successful uh, first case study. So now on to the second one. Uh, in collaboration with Penquan Lau, um, he looked at, in the past, 27 different antibodies, and this is showing their viscosities at 150 uh, grams per liter for these 27. And this work um, for, within the trout group as well, 
uh, they use machine learning to, to try and predict these, these viscosities. So uh, Pinquan shared the structures of um, four different uh, antibodies from this group, including the highest um, viscosity ones, MAVs 17 and, and 4, as well as low viscosity uh, 10 and 27. And so we're going to apply this coarse grain methodology I described, and let's see if we can um, make some predictions. So this is showing the VIRA coefficient. Again, lower VIRA coefficient has higher traction. So MAB17 had the lowest VIRA coefficient, which is also the highest viscosity. And four had the uh, second highest viscosity and the second lowest VIRA coefficient. So these are pretty promising uh, results for this coarse grain uh, approach. MABs 26 and 10 are the ones that have the lower viscosity um, and they have the higher VIRA coefficient. So just uh, using the VIRA coefficient, we've already sort of been able to rank order these in terms of their viscosity by, by cor just correlating them. Um, so if we look at the fab fab interactions, uh, this is at 150, um, oh, 150 salt, uh, 100 grams per liter. We see, again, the, the interactions between the fabs are highest for the green uh, MAV-17, which had the highest viscosity, but, and, and the red was low, right? But there's this interesting case here. What happened to uh, MAV-4 and, and 10? So 10 had a low viscosity and 4 had a high viscosity, but their fab interactions seem to be about the same. So, so what's going on here? What are we missing? So I'm going to go back to this uh, amazing plot that um, Marco made years ago. Um, and so in the previous case study, I kind of glossed over that all the FCs were the same. Well, in this case study, the FCs are not the same. So we're missing this information. We need to know, we, we've looked at the FAB-FAB interaction, but what about the FC-FC interaction, okay? That's going to help us distinguish between the blue and the orange one, right? The blue had the um, high viscosity, okay? So if we look at the FC-FC interaction, blue is, the blue one is down here with red, but the orange one is almost as high as the uh, 17 that had the high viscosity. So what that means is that the orange one is more in the center of this and this axis because both the FC and the FAB were high interaction. So it might be somewhere over here, but in the um, in the blue MAP4 case, since the FC interaction was was lower, it pushed it into this clan, uh, transient cluster regime. So to conclude uh, the first part of this talk, I um, just like to say that um, given just the MAP sequence and some uh, autumn force field taken from the literature, we're able to use this coarse grinding approach without any adjustable parameters. Uh, to make accurate predictions of the high concentration behavior of the antibodies um, that were using these pre-computed um, coarse grain models. So this approach is actually useful for a lot of complex models, not just antibodies even. And it's a code that I've made um, open source and available to the community. So if you'd like to use it, uh, send, you can send me an email at herald.hatch at nist.gov or uh, visit the software website uh, feast with two S's. And um, yeah, I'd be interested in, in, in using this, this methodology um, in helping the community. So I'm going to uh, take about five more minutes really quickly to talk about the software uh, that was used in all of the um, results I just showed you this, in this talk. Okay, so why do I even care about software? Well, I've seen firsthand how um, something as simple as a coding error in what happened to be a sophisticated uh, Monte Carlo technique that wasn't available open source could lead to a seven year dispute um, and, and finally be solved when the, when, when the uh, codes were made available. Um, and NIST also has a very important role to play for standards in, in software. So, so simulations uh, even play a very important role in, in, uh, in the scientific method, because when you compare simulation experiment, you get a handle on the model approximations that were made. And then when you compare simulation theory, you get a handle on the theoretical approximations. Um, and just as NIST has an important role to play for standards in these experiments, NIST also has a role to play for standards in, in simulations. So in our group, uh, this has been available before I even joined the group. We have this NIST uh, standard reference simulation website that I used as a as a young uh, graduate student even. 
that provides a lot of um, well-tested data for uh, simple models that you can use to, to test your codes. Um, also, why do I make the software available? Well, there's a need, if you look at the community, there's a need for Monte Carlo software because if you rank order uh, scientific software by citations, you see there's a lot of well-used quantum and molecular dynamics uh, codes, but um, you have to go down toward the bottom to find the first Monte Carlo. Uh, RASP is an amazing uh, code, um, and it's I'd like to see Monte Carlo just used more generally in the community because it has a lot of methodology uh, available to it, um, like Mayer sampling, Gibbs ensemble, phi histogram, and grand canonical ensemble simulations. So these are made available in the feast code that I've uh, developed, and and um, it has two S's because I wish I, it was as cool as lamps. Um, it has the the anstropic tabulated potentials that I talked about, as well as some of the co cool conversion bias stuff. I'm not going to go through this whole list. I'll just show a few videos in the last couple minutes of the talk. So uh, here's an example of flat histogram grand canonical Monte Carlo simulations where the, the volume fraction is changing. This red uh, dot is corresponding with this instantaneous configuration of Leonard Jones particles that are being inserted and deleted from the simulation. And we can get, uh, we can look at the, the probability of transitioning uh, between different numbers of particles. And that allows us to calculate the probability of the vapor and the liquid and uh, rigorously calculate phase diagrams that way. I'm also showing examples of circles that are slowly morphing into uh, squares by random Monte Carlo trials and shape expanded by histogram simulations that we can use to look at how the shape uh, changes the kind of stable structures that would form. And this example had uh, cylindrical colloids that uh, had an attractive interaction due to depletant in the solution, and uh, they they gel, and we had some um, uh, comparisons with experiment there. Uh, we also have cases where, for example, the coarse grain antibodies might form clusters like these, and so you need rigid cluster moves in Monte Carlo to be able to efficiently sample these, and those are available in the code, as well as um, conventional bias, aggregation volume bias methods to find a favorable relative um, orientations between uh, flexible molecules. So to wrap up the talk, again, I'd like to just acknowledge all the many people and institutions involved in this project and thank everyone for their time. I'd be happy to take any questions.